good afternoon. It's lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you may notice that I am not, in fact, Eddie Muller. <laughs> this is Eddie's suit, though. I did borrow it, so hopefully that aura is projected to all of you. Uh, my name is Vince Keenan. I am one half of the mystery novelist Renee Patrick with my lovely wife, Rosemary. Magazine, which was published by Eddie's Fillmore Foundation. Do we have any foundation members in the audience today? Oh, you people are my favorites. Uh, if you would, if you're all interested in joining the foundation and helping support our mission of preserving, restoring, and exhibiting classic film art, please stop by the table in the lobby and see the lovely Darl. She will help you join up and doing a donation drive this weekend. You have the opportunity to win a fantastic collection of the best film or posters by Mark Furtick, a book published by Seattle's own Fanographic Books. Uh, please stop by to see Darl Schill, she'll get set up. Uh, I want to also reassure you, Eddie will be back tonight. He's attending his foundation business today. I am happy to step in for him and introduce our double bill of heist films from England, or as Daily Variety still insists on calling it, Blighty. <laughs> we are going to begin with The Lady Killer. Perhaps the greatest comic caper ever made. Some fans here, and, and let's be honest, we're showing this because in the movie so far, things haven't exactly gone well. <laughs> and we need to see a movie that acknowledges that and, and posts fun at it, I think. It's high time. It's, it's a break for all. This is a film from Ealing Studios. You can't talk about English movies without talking about Ealing. If you look at the British Film Institute list of the 100 greatest British films ever made, it positively bristles with healing titles. They made all kinds of movies. If any of you were at our international festival a couple of years ago, you saw a haunting film that they made called It Always Rains on Sunday. But they are best known for their comedies. Made after the war, offbeat, black comedies and manners that kind of define the English sense of humor. Uh, movies like Kind Hearts and Cornets, the Lavender Hill Mob, and the Crown Jewel, the Lady Killers. The guiding light behind Elon Studios and the producer of this film was a man named Michael Balkin, whose place in film history would have been secure because he was the first person to say to Alfred Hitchcock, yeah, you can draw. <laughs> uh, he had a, he's a fascinating man, long career, got every accolade imaginable, including one that's most important to an Englishman, not a nightmare, although he does have that. There was a pub named after him. It is actually in Ealing, in West London, where the movies were made. And his family's still in the business. His, his grandson, you may be familiar with, is a very promising actor named Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> so, we are talking here about the quintessentially English studio with a quintessentially English film, naturally written by an American. <laughs> William Rose, who in 1939 decided he didn't want to wait for the United States to get into World War II. He crossed the border into Canada to join up. After the war, he remained in England and uh, did a lot of his writing issues for Ealing <clears throat> Studio. Uh, the thing about this, his script for this movie that tries to be crazy is that the story that he always told people was it came to him in a dream. <laughs> he wanders into the, to the commissary at Ealing, or canteen probably. It's called elevator, so that's not good, by the way. Um, and he starts telling people about this dream that he has about a gang of hoodlums who are foiled in everything they attempt to do by sweet little old lady. And to Michael Balkin's credit, he said, that's a movie, why don't you get to work? And the resulting movie actually plays like a dream. There's this kind of fantastic otherworldly quality to it. And a lot of the credit for that belongs to the director, Alexander Kendrick, who is sort of the William Rose story in reverse. He starts in the United Kingdom and ends up in the United States. He had made a number of movies for Ealing. By this point, people were aware of him, but when this exploded, this was a huge international hit. This was a movie that had made America say, Sam, come on over. And two years later, he directs the noir city classic, Sweet Smell of Success. His career after that did not exactly go the way that he wanted it to. He didn't have the hit of that nature again. His, his real legacy in a lot of ways is as a teacher. He ended up at Cal Arts as both an administrator and a professor. Uh, taught directing in a way that uh, won him legions of followers. So many students ended up going into the film business. 
And all of his lectures have been collected in a fascinating book called On Filmmaking. If you're all interested in the Dustin Bull side of directing, there are a few books you can look at that are more interesting than this one. We have to talk a little bit about the cast, because you, it's cute to see what we're about to see. We're getting Peter Sellers very early on in his career. Uh, he would say that this is the first real film that he ever made. And the entire time he was making it, all he did was watch out. <laughs> like a hawk. Guinness was his idol, one of the first people to play multiple roles in a film which was going to become part of seller stock and trade. Just stole everything. Uh, you'll also see Herbert Long, and uh, a couple years down the road, Sellers and Long have bedeviled each other in the Pink Panther movies. But here they're on the same side, basically. And we must say a few words about Katie Johnson, who plays Mrs. Wilberforce who completely writes the plan, the perfect plan that Alan Kitts has set up. Uh, I like to think of her in a way as the female Sydney Greenstreet. She did not make her movie debut until she was 53 years old. She was, she'd been in a number of movies at this point, but when this came out, she instantly became a star. Sadly, she only made one movie after this, passed away two years later, but we have to give her credit for going out on a high note. She, she would never be in a movie that was as big as this. You will still on occasion see the Ealing Studios name has been revived. It's not the, the powerhouse that it once was. Uh, the last, second to last film that they made is a straight ahead film noir called Nowhere to Go in 1958. And I'm happy to say we're going to be spotlighting this in Mark City Magazine later this year. So again, you should really subscribe to it. <laughs> What's noteworthy about that film is it marks the screen debut of Dave Maggie Smith. And I mention this because Dave Maggie obviously now is best known for her work on Downton Abbey. And the interiors of Downton Abbey are all shot at Ealing Studios. It's still, it's still in existence today as a production facility, and so you have in fact seen this studio before. So I think I've set this up enough. You are in for an absolute treat. This movie's a delight from start to finish. And please enjoy the lady film. 